So I would like to um, present Professor Ger George uh, Crouch. I can't say that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> but uh, you will say the name properly. <laughs> he is uh, the president of the Johannes Gutenberg University at Mainz in Germany. He's been the uh, president since 2007. And this uh, very long trajectory has placed him in an excellent position to plan and implement strategic decisions for his university, obviously also including um, social issues, at social issues level. He, he says that uh, he sees his university as an open university that forms integral part of the society. And I think that that is very important. So I think that uh, we'll be very, very happy to welcome you and thank you. Well, you're very happy. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm so happy. Uh, after these first two talks, which I found very moving, and I'm not sure how I can give my presentation as planned after these first presentations. Don't, don't move it. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a nice one. <laughs> Uh, during the second presentation, I, I uh, was reminded to this to this quote that every human being is a foreigner almost everywhere, <laughs> um, which for us would mean we should send our German students all over the world, as many of them, as a large fraction of them as possible, to make them feel exactly this experience, at least for a year or so. Um, so they would come back uh, uh, moved or in a, in a different way. Um, when I listened to your presentation, I, I recalled uh, heavy discussions that we had a couple of years ago in the framework of this, this refugee movement from Syria in large numbers to, to Europe and to Germany as well, where we eventually came to the point that we don't want any special programs for ref refugees because we didn't want to stigmatize them once again. We would rather make sure that they know enough German to you know, like handle what we do. Uh, all together and at the same time, um, well, treat them as, as international students or treat them as students, right? But this is kind of nice Sunday talk because real life is different, not only for you and, and for other refugees. It's like if I, if I talk to the people advising students or advising high school students who want to become a student at the university, what subject would be the right one and so on and so forth, they all of a sudden have to give advice to people what traumatized to an extent that they are simply not prepared for. They may have to tell them, no, your grades are not good enough to you know, be admitted to the university. And these people may have their fam family or part of their family in Syria uh, being in danger to death or whatever. They're just, they, I mean, how can they ever study regularly and so on? But how can our people who are not trained psychologists in these positions, how can they deal with them? And how, what can we do responsible for our employees? Uh, what can, can we do to, to like help them to, uh, to cope with this new situation? So what, what I'm saying is celebrating diversity is nice but we have to be careful. I have to be careful that it's not just nice Sunday talk because it's it, the problems beyond. And I mean, you mentioned, I mean, you're like individual perception of what happened, but the problems beyond are, uh, I think, a little bit deeper. Um, although, and I'll get back to that, it's actually my deep uh, conviction. This is why, why I'm, I'm very much uh, behind uh, the university somehow dealing with diversity because I think exactly we should we should try to well to celebrate diversity in the sense to to really make clear the advantages that come along with diverse teams and, and with diversity at the university. So um, this is not what I wanted to start with, um, uh, but anyways, I found this important to say. So probably what I will do is I will go through some of this stuff rather quickly so not to not not to stress your timetable too much uh, what i want to do in the first place was that i wanted to to give you some some more general remarks which all of you 
No, and the last presentation already gave a nice summary of what we kind of know about the importance of diversity, in its inclusion in, into higher education. And I wanted to give you a, just a couple of like concrete examples of what we are doing to, to, um, to move the university, because that's kind of my job. Um, <coughs> just some words on the institution itself. I have it here as well. Great. So, um, Johannes Gutenberg University is one of the old European universities founded in the 15th century. Um, moved by the European history, it was closed uh, in, in the context of the Napoleonic Wars in 1800. It was reopened after, immediately after the Second World War by the French Allied forces. Uh, we have strong links to France. They, they closed us, they opened us. Um, we are pretty close to the German-French border in Mainz. Uh, meanwhile, the university has grown to one of the large comprehensive German universities. So we, we look at some 31, 32,000 students. We, we cover pretty much all academic disciplines. Um, we, we run 260 degree programs. Uh, we have students from 120 nations. So we, we have a lot of diversity um, simply by that. But diversity certainly goes beyond just nationalities or cultures. Um, we have some four to five thousand uh, people working for the 32 and with the 32,000 students. And this is typically this is the, the advertisement sheet. In, in, this, uh, in this context here, what it should show you is simply the size of the institution. Um, I'm a physicist by education and you learn uh, that, that according to Newton's second law, um, things move slowly when they are large, right? And the larger they are, the more force it takes to get any kind of acceleration. Um, and this is what it shows. So if you want, if you want to move, it takes, it takes a lot of power and it takes, um, it takes a lot of time at the same time. And you go with small steps. Uh, but anyways, now the next three view graphs were meant to describe like the framework in which we do all that, all what we do, right? So we have a demographic change in Germany. Um, on the one hand, we have an increasing fraction of young, of a young generation seeking higher education, which needs to lead to an increasing heterogeneity. Um, on the other hand, for demographic reason, we have a, an overall decline in, in members of the young generation, so to say. Uh, we have a shortage of specialists, right? So there, there are various aspects of diversity in here already. There's a larger heterogeneity on the one hand. On the other hand, you need to include everyone anyways because you need them the, uh, finally, right? So there, there are different aspects. I don't think we have to talk about the Bologna reform. Uh, certainly there, there is the idea to, to have a, a, a well, lifelong learning. That's not necessarily Bologna reform. This is simply the very quick turnover of knowledge these days. Um, which, which lead to an increased importance of lifelong learning. Um, we see an increasing need uh, for student and staff mobility. We want higher permobilities uh, in higher education. Um, if we talk about equal opportunities, we have to realize that gender equality is not yet established. It is not. We are looking at 22, 23 percent female professors in Germany, uh, the same at our university. Uh, although we hire typically 35% female these days on the professorships. So we're moving, but we're moving slowly, obviously. Um, discrimination experiences versus inclusion, um, unequal educational opportunities. Uh, we have an incre increasing number of foreign students in Germany uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, how we deal with diversity is also a matter of our competitiveness, right? Um, for students as well as for scientists, for researchers from all over the world. Right? Internationalization at home is like the other side of sending people out there. Right? If we have students from 120 nations, our German students um, are exposed to them, which is a good idea and we want to mix them and we want to, to, uh, um, to enable intercultural experience in everyday life. Right? Um, we have dormitories, for instance, where, where uh, foreign students are, are, uh, are mixed with, um, with local students on purpose. So they, they look for a, a particular wide mixture instead of just taking a group of 100 Chinese, right? 
Um, we need to professionalize. I mean, uh, working in heterogeneous teams is not only something that we want to teach our students, but we have to learn it ourselves as well, right? I mean, those of us who are already, um, um, well, with my hair uh, color and, and density, um, we also have to work still and we have to learn how to work in heterogeneous teams. Um, we need to, to make use of all the potential that we have, um, learning together, learning from each other. I don't have to go all through that because this is kind of the, the basic framework that I guess you all know if you went through this uh, project. Competitiveness among universities is an increasing factor, uh, at least in Germany. Um, so you need to be attractive, uh, you need to raise your profile. Um, and, and your potentials. So in, in say on this, in this framework, um, if we look at diversity in higher education, and maybe I should, I should stop for a second, say, I mean, most of what I tell you here, you can probably read in books or papers, right? But this doesn't really help us because we have to find it out ourselves because I cannot ask the 4,000 people to read all the papers. So what we do, we do workshops and we try to find out ourselves what is, what is important for us. The results are then very similar to what you find in the papers because what you find in the papers probably is as true as what we find out ourselves. So just to, to make this point, if I say what, what we consider important in terms of our diversity is what is the result of workshops that, that we run ran in, within our university to somehow deal with the subject, right? Well, one point that was kind of, of important was uh, that we recognize not only differences, but also similarities. I mean, we have a multi-dimensional, um, uh, we have multi-dimensional diversity aspects, if you like. And, um, and obviously people may be different in one aspect, they're very similar in another, maybe unexpectedly, right? So, so we always, try to make sure we're not just looking at differences and, and, and say, well, you, you belong to this group or that group and the third one, but we see that, that people are different and they are similar in, in, in the various dimensions of diversity. Well, the typical categories, age, gender, nationality, and so on, you know, what we find quite important actually at the university is that, that uh, social background and performance heterogeneity are, are as important as many of the others, if not even more for us. It makes a big difference whether students have to work to make their living or whether they have rich parents and they can fully concentrate on their studies, right? Um, it makes a, uh, a big difference what they know as a basic knowledge when they enter university, right? Which again is, is very different and as a larger fraction of a generation enters higher education, obviously there must be a heterogeneity, a growing heterogeneity in, in, the, in, the, um, in their background knowledge, so to say, and what they know when they enter. So we, we want to break homogenous ideals. Um, the typical 18-year-old white male student from a good mid-class German family um, is by far not the typical student anymore. Uh, he may have been 50 years ago. Uh, this has changed and we simply, we simply have to work on realizing that this has changed. It sounds funny. I'm 57, right? So my, my 30th birthday is quite some time ago, right? I became educated in the 20s, right? So I learned what university is like 30 years ago. And it's not so easy to always keep updated on what things are like. Right? You grow and you know, you think you know how you, what university is like. That's what we find in our professorship. Many of our colleagues just think that university is like it was when they were students, because this was when they were first in contact with university. And so there's a lot, it's kind of trivial things if you think about it, but it does not mean that it's in the back of the, of the brain of someone standing in front of a class. Right? <laughs> and, um, and just realizing that there, that there are social differences, right? we, we have this case in an in a, in a art history class when, when the professor said, well, you need to buy a camera, um, right? Um, 
around 1,000 euro the piece, right? Otherwise, you, you shouldn't continue the study, right? Because you should be able to take photographs of art pieces. Uh, not realizing that 1,000 euro may be a real problem for someone who doesn't really know how to get through the next month in terms of, of food and, and living, right? And, and simply trying to, you know, get this into the back of, the, of, of people's hearts standing in front of glasses is actually a problem. It sounds trivial. It is not in real life, right? So, not just leveling out, but realizing difference, celebrate diversity, we just heard about this, right? Uh, different social backgrounds I just mentioned. Um, discriminations historically developed. Um, we want to take a multi-dimensional view. We actually want certainly take a respectful view. And we want to get away from this problem-oriented view. Again, careful, not just Sunday speech. Um, there are problems, right? But we don't want to just look at it from the, this is a problem that has to be solved. Right? Um, we want to establish a culture at our university, and what I quote is just a result of, of our discussions. I'll get to practical examples in a minute, right? That, that all our members are unable to best possibly participate in all processes. This does not only include students, it does include everyone, right? You want to be able to participate in all the processes. We, um, we do not want that the success of our students, as well as our employees, are adversely affected by social democratic factors. Um, access to the university, this was mentioned in the first talk, as well as transitions within the universities, should not be fundamentally influenced by dimensional factors. Right? We should learn that diversity is an enriching opportunity to actively shape intellectual discourse. This, actually, I'll give you one example, but this is, I find, the most challenging aspect. To give really good examples where you have this enrichment beyond that you can feel it and it's more interesting to work in a, in a multi, multicultural group or so. But where is a real advantage for the institution that you can kind of count? I'll give you one um, that I'm particularly proud of, uh, but it's actually not so many more. Getting rid of, of inequalities, of discrimination, is, I mean, we have to do this by law. I find this intellectually boring. It is very difficult and it takes a lot of time and money and so on, but it's intellectually not very interesting. It's obvious, right? I mean, if you look at our constitution, men and women have the same rights, so it's my task to make sure that in my institution this is true. Or what, what are we going to discuss, right? Um, whereas uh, whereas the, the enriching part of it, I find inspiring. I find this is, there, there's something that I don't know yet and there's something that we have to find out that we work on and work on. So this is, uh, this is why I like this point. Um, all right, that the, that the old academic environment is rather homogeneous, has a homogeneous character. You, you know all that and I don't want to bore you. So, um, we considered establishing diversity management a cross-sectional task. We try to do this actively rather than react to problems, right? This is why we decided to take part in, in a diversity audit uh, uh, two years ago. Um, this is offered by the, by the Donors Association for, for, uh, for the German universities, the Stifterverband für die Deutsche Wissenschaft. Um, so they give them money and they give certain rules to this audit. So we had, to, we had to identify a particular group within our university that we want to deal with. So we figured the largest group are the students, so we deal with the students. And then we had to identify particular aspects of diversity that we consider particularly relevant within this group. And then we looked particularly at, um, at the, the social background and, and heterogeneity in, in, um, um, in their educational background. So we went through this in, in 16 and 17, and, and some of the stuff that, that is mentioned here is actually came out of this audit. Um, uh, communication seems an, an important point, because the organization is so large. Whenever you talk to some head of a large organization, you will say communication is the most important and most frustrating aspect. You do something, you work hard, you think you do something intelligent for the institution and, uh, and you go out 
to some members, some of the 4,000 people working for us, and they think, oh, this president on top of the news does some, mm, um, uh, more or less meaningful things, we do our work and we don't care, right? It's very difficult. I talk to the deans, the deans talk to the heads of the institutes, um, and as you know, on each note, you lose some information or it is changed and so on. It's just really difficult, but it's nothing, there's nothing special to a university. If you run a company with 30,000 people, it's pretty much the same, right? It's very, very difficult. So I just give you one, say, trivial example. Um, we, we try to simply visualize the rich variety among our members by photo shootings. Um, and we, we've done this, um, once already in 2011 in the context of the German Excellence Initiative um, where we had a motto, um, uh, the Gutenberg spirit, what does it mean? Well, Gutenberg invented the printing process movable letters, thereby he, he allowed mankind to be informed, the first media revolution, this is the basis of all democracy and so on and so forth. So, finding something new, doing some innovation to, to make people's lives better. Well, this is beyond everything we do every day. I mean, this is beyond research, right? There's no other, there's no other driving force behind research. Um, and uh, so we have this good mix spirit because it's the name of our university and this is the man of the millennium and, and, and the most, the most well-known son of the city of Mainz. And the subtitle was Moving Minds Crossing Boundaries, which tells you a little bit about uh, that institution indeed moving, uh, crossing boundaries on, again, various dimensions. Moving minds, we want to move the minds of our students, we want to move the minds of the society we belong to. Um, and we simply asked a photographer to find out what moves the minds of, of our people. So we, we picked 50 faces of our university students, president, whatever, all across. Um, and we all were captured with a hobby, with our most favorite hobby. Uh, so we wanted to find out where do people take their power from when they come to work, right? Um, and that turned out to be a very, very nice uh, um, uh, exhibition which is, uh, which is displayed in the administration building until today and has seen very many visitors. Uh, to we have done in the framework of this audit, we have done it a second time, more open with even more faces. Um, and actually you have seen the results already because they are, they are pictured all over the, my, my presentation. Um, it was an exhibition, there is a leaflet with all these pictures which we take. It's, there's nothing to it, it doesn't cost much money, but it's just to show um, and everyone Everyone could be, um, was pictured the way he or she wanted, right? Um, and you see that people are, you just have the typical portraits, you have different ones. People are captured from the back or with hands in front of their faces, whatever they found appropriate for them, right? Um, now let me see whether this works. It does. Communicate the benefits. Um, the benefits is, and I mentioned it several times already, the benefits is one of the things that are difficult to communicate. And I'll just give you one example where it is easy to communicate. It is about uh, becoming a medical doctor in Germany. Um, if you want to enter medical school in Germany, you have to have excellent grades in high school. It's actually the final exam in high school or the German Abitur is, if you like, a final exam plus an average of the last two years in high school. And you really have to have very, very good grades, otherwise you will not become a medical doctor. Now, the state of Rheinland-Palatinate, where we are in, found this uh, not a very good idea. So they offered, by, by law, they offered an alternative access to the medical school, um, which is not based on your achievements in high school, which is based on your achievements in a professional education, in a job or in a profession which is related to medicine, right? So you become a nurse, you become a physiotherapist, you become a um, whatever, paramedic, right? You have very good grades becoming a nurse. You can apply for, for admission to the, to, the, um, to the medical school. What we see is that an increasing number of people enter our medical school. We're talking about 10%, 12% already out of three and a half thousand students in the medical school. So it's a real, uh, real numbers, right? Well, 
Now you have two groups of first year students with significantly different competences, right? So we are diverse here. Why? Because the, those kids who come from high school directly with the best grades you can get there, they have no problems in math or science, right? They just, they just did it, right? Others have left high school. They may not even have gone to the, to the final year of high school. They left, became a nurse, had worked like for 10 years, they know exactly what a patient looks like. They have no idea of math and, and, and science. Now, you may know that in the beginning of, of the medical school, you do math and science. This is what you do. You don't see patients, right? So what we found was, obviously, that those who came in on the different way weren't able to perform, right? It simply didn't work. Um, so what they did in the medical school is they established a course, right? They established a course particularly for those and only for those who came in through professional education. Yeah, not exactly what we think is the right way, but this is what was done as a reaction of to the problem, right? What happened was that the other group of students uh, envied the, the, the professional ones. And we also want this course, right? Because it turned out to be a good course. Well, then they opened the course for everyone, right? So actually, the group of the minority group made it better for the entire rest of, of, the, uh, of the students. And all together, and this was actually great, after the first two years, there is a test uh, in Germany, which is actually a nationwide competition. And you can, you can exactly tell, uh, we have 37 universities with medical schools, right? You can exactly tell what rank you are with the results of your students. So the overall performance of all students became significantly better in the nationwide competition. And, and this is probably more important even, you cannot read from the final result of the exam whether someone has excellent grades in high school or whether this is a nurse or a paramedic. There's no way this was just leveled out by this additional course. Now this course became part of the regular curriculum and people are happy. Little problem, if you may ask a, a university president, this costs money. And of course the state legislation has changed. So they admit, now we can admit these people, which is probably a good idea in, in producing good doctors at the end of the day. Um, but we don't know how to pay for it. So, um, and there's an additional advantage and this is obvious. The, the, the nurses and the paramedics, they know what a patient is and they can actually motivate the other students because they know what they, where they're going with this study. They want to become a medical doctor. They want to see patients at the end of the day. And since the first two years is very hard doing all this math and natural sciences, it's a good idea to have a couple of students who actually know and can tell um, what a patient looks like and where, where all um, ends up. All right. The third example that I that I um, that I mentioned, and this actually relates very much to the second talk: uh, changing perspective. Changing perspective is actually this is very important in many many uh, uh, instances in life. Um, but in the framework of this diversity audit, we we had, and this was on the on the fourth di German Diversity Day uh, last year. Um, we try to identity, identify pairs within our university population to change roles for one day and, and then accompany this. Um, I mean, they, the pairs would meet at the end of the day and exchange their experiences and so on and so forth. Now, you always do need role models. So the university president obviously has to take part in this. And he did, as you can see down there, because I had to control all the incoming traffic this morning. Um, because I, I, my, my partner was, uh, was uh, this nice guy here from the, from the security uh, in charge of traffic at the university. So I, um, at this time, we had certain regulations, who was allowed to enter and park and who would not and, and so on and so forth. And I had to do this, which was an interesting experience for me because I had never thought about what that would mean and how much work it is and actually how it is to stand there and have like 1,000 cars pass you and, and say, yeah, you can go, you can go, or you please open the window. And, and it was obviously a good idea because 1,000 people, members of the university, saw this. And they were kind of surprised to, you know, like be confronted with the president at the beginning of their working day. Um, 
It was quite exciting for this guy because the security guy um, gave a welcome address uh, opening uh, a conference. The president. Uh, hmm? he, became the president. he became the president, right. And this is, wow. this is showing him becoming the president. And um, again, this doesn't cost any money. It was simply a good idea. I, I may say so because it was not my idea. Um, it had a very high visibility, certainly because the university president said he would participate, which was fun for the university president. Uh, so we had media coverage, we had a TV station accompanying us throughout the day. Um, it was sent in the evening news, uh, at least locally. Right? Um, we even received an award for this initiative uh, uh, later on because it's so nice. Again, this is very, it's like the photo shooting. It doesn't cost much money, but it makes people simply think about sitting at the other side of the table. Right. All right. Um, this again, I can. What, what, how are we doing time wise? I think you can go on for 10 minutes. Okay, well, this is. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, this again goes back to the second presentation it, and, and to your project, right? These are questions are going also back to our audit, addressing the students. Um, uh, how can we actually enter diversity in the curricula? How can students really benefit from it? And then for me, the question, how can we train the teachers or the, the, right, the instructors um, to do so? Um, we have a chart, and I don't think you can read it. I hate charts that you can't read, uh, that you can't read. Um, this is a chart just showing what entering diversity in teaching in higher education may imply what aspects you may want to check, right? Um, and you see on the, on the left-hand side um, aspects of diversity, social background, resources, I mean, socioeconomic resources, cultural background, age, gender, sexual orientation, family situation, uh, individual physical and mental disposition. We didn't talk about this at all at the moment, and so on, right? And at the other side, the academic success, right, which we actually want to have independent of all the left side aspects. Um, so if you like this chart, simply shows the challenge, right, and it shows, shows factors that you want to, that you want to um, address or, or, or consider. Um, what the, the way we, we try to do this is we try to include diversity aspects in our human resources development programs at the university. Um, we are a university where every newly appointed professor has to undergo three programs in, in, in HR development. One has to be uh, a didactics program and typically the other one is a leadership program and so on. And in all these programs, diversity aspects are included these days. That was an outcome of this diversity audit because this is the way, again, with limited resources to kind of transport the theme and the ideas into the university, slowly but constantly over years, right? Um, I also like very much in the second talk that you, that you look critically on, on, on outcomes. I mean, we are a university, so we actually have to, to ask from ourselves that whatever we do is scientifically reflected. We just, we, we don't just do something. Actually, we often just do something and, and, and don't uh, live up to our, to our claims. But here, uh, we want to study the effects that we, that we kind of induce here. We want to study it and have a feedback back into uh, HR um, development programs. Which is not trivial. I mean, we have a we have a, an, an own part, uh, uh, an own research area of of higher education studies, uh, and these people then try to look and see. It's just at least from the physicist's eyes, it's not so easy in social science to get you know to really tell this measure has led to this success. Yeah, with this student. I mean, this is very difficult to say so. But anyways, um, I make the point because I, I think this is important. The same holds like for gender issues. We have a lot of, of you know, measures to improve gender balance and so on and so forth. 
at the end of the day, you have to check whether it works or not because it costs money and it costs actually taxpayers money at the end of the day. So we have a responsibility to convince ourselves that what we do is meaningful and successful at the end of the day. Have we learned anything so far? I hope I can. You have learned that we are in like in the middle of the process. I mean, it's not that we are at any end or success story or whatever. There may be little successes, but we are in the middle of a long process. Um, uh, I am convinced that we you need a comprehensive strategy rather than than isolated solutions. We are presently looking at uh, at a draft of a diversity strategy, which. Um, which has emerged from workshops, which now goes to our 10 faculties. Uh, they should you now discuss and, and comment, and then it goes back. And eventually, the Senate of the university, like the, the parliament, the highest democratic body of the university, would, um, would decide on a final version or on an actual version of a diversity strategy. Uh, we have to consider the specific situation of the institution. This is obvious. Um, we very much would like to eventually have approaches that we know work and we want to critically check this. Um, the, needs, uh, the, the need of a permanent communication is there and it will continue uh, for the next 10 years. There's no question, things move slowly. And uh, it was very funny actually when we started, um, it was established as a project. So we had a project diversity and there was a peop someone was hired and 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 she said uh, please don't put me into the gender and equal opportunities office because if I come from there people will tell me oh gosh right that's this gender thing right you can't hear it anymore it's so you are in a certain tradition right and it is this is a problem for diversity aspects as we learned meanwhile after three years um, uh, the gender office, so to say, was renamed and it is now Equal Opportunities and Diversity um, and includes more than just gender issues, right? But we, we started differently and probably was a good idea to get people involved rather than uh, uh, have a rejecting uh, attitude. Role models, peer influencers, well, I, I see, uh, and I tried to show this at, at least one example, see, indeed, you, if you want, but that holds for, for whatever I do within the university, if, if I want to change something, I have to stand for it with my own personality. And part of it is that you, you then uh, play the games and, and make, the, make it visible, right? Certainly, we have traditional notions of normality in, in uh, terms of academic careers and leadership, which have to be broken. And, uh, uh, and there are two limitations. Um, they are they're, they're put at the end uh, for good reasons, because I don't want to say, when well, we don't have money, we don't do anything. I, I gave you a couple of examples, two examples which did not cost much, one which did cost, right? Resources are very limited, which also means that every single person out of these 4,000 work at their limits already. And now this president comes and says, well, now we have to deal with diversity. And so well, no time, right? My, my week is full already, my weekend too, so uh, leave me alone. I mean, limited resources does not only mean that I don't have money for large, spectacular projects, but also that, that people whom I want to, to, to move are difficult to move for good reasons because they already have enough to do. Right? Legal boundaries um, are always a problem. I, I have uh, a last view graph on, on political incentives. Um, we certainly we certainly agree with with the um, AG for to, uh, for you two recommendation that national governments should provide incentives. Um, this always is helpful. Money always makes things a little bit smoother, right? Um, it is also important to see that we need a holistic approach. Our government, for instance, in contrast to what I said at the very beginning, they established programs for refugees, right? Well, yeah, I, I understand this to a certain extent, but this is not the way we want to look at it eventually, right? Um, 
We have a general equal treatment act um, for protection against discrimination, which actually is good, but it does not um, address social inequalities. And, and for us, this does make a difference. So this would be something that, that may want to be changed, right? And then we have a, we have actually, it's not state funding, it's a federal funding of um, our students. Um, about 20% of our students receive uh, what is called BAföG in Germany, receive a, a financial aid up to some 700, 750 euro a month um, by the federal government based solely on the income of the parents. So if the parents don't earn enough money, um, then you can get this money. You get it as a loan, eventually you pay it back, but only if you have income, so it just, just makes sense. But uh, there is an age limit in here, which probably is not a good idea in uh, diversity-wise. If I see your career, for instance, right, you work first and so eventually you decide for whatever reasons, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you're too old, right? And then, then you can study, but no one pays for it. It's not a good idea either, right? The payment levels are, um, are a problem too. Particularly, there is no difference between the place where you study. And in Germany, at least, we have very different cost of living depending on whether you study in Munich or in Oldenburg or something like that, right? Um, and, but you receive exactly the same money. So if you study in Oldenburg, it's actually fine. If you get 750 euros, it's no problem. Your room costs like 200 and the rest is for your living, right? If you study in Munich, you need the 750 for your room, more or less, right? That's, uh, that is a problem. And, um, uh, and the new study structure within Bologna is a problem. Lifelong learning is not really covered. Um, uh, so uh, certain adaptions here are uh, important. This is actually a big problem when, you comes, when it comes to diversity in, in your knowledge when you start. Some students would need this one extra year uh, you know, to get them up the level, say in math or in German or, or whatever, right, before they could just enter. We're not allowed to do this, but we're allowed to do this. But then the students would not get this support. And if they need it because the parents are poor, then we have a problem, right? And since we in Germany still have a, a very close uh, relation between the income of the parents and, and, the, and the academic education state of the kids, this is a real problem because we have to address those whose parents are not really rich. And, and so there's, there are certain problems uh, legally um, where, we, where we try to work on. We don't do this at our university, we do this on the, on the rector's conference level uh, in Germany. So this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention and thanks for inviting me.